Hello, this is Don Victor, author of Drawn to Win, host of the podcast Drawn to Win, the director of the Academy of Composition, and the creator of the Core 80 Experience, also known as the C and Grow Rich in Art video course, which you can find out more information at core80.com. This is the Drawn to Win podcast, where I have the incredible privilege to draw artists from around the world into fun and meaningful conversations around art and life, and yes, maybe even a little food. You can hear us each week on iTunes, Stitcher, SoundCloud, and YouTube. So make sure you subscribe so you always have a seat among friends. Let's get into the show. Judith, welcome yeah. to the show. Thank you very much. Indeed. Um, where are you located? Uh, Vienna, Virginia, right outside of Washington, D.C. Vienna, Virginia. What a wonderful sound that just comes off the tongue. <laughs> wow. That's such a cool sounding place. I wish it was Vienna, <laughs> Austria. but <laughs> <laughs> Well, that would be cool. Um, ha- have you ever been to uh, Europe? Yes, many yeah. times. Oh, shoot. Do, do tell us a story. Well, um, you know, I was scraping around in Washington as an, you know, I went to school here. And so anytime I saved any money, I would take a trip. Yeah. I think that um, it's really important to expose yourself to as much as possible culture, all different kinds of culture, international culture and opera and dance and art and plays and you know everything you can to feed feed you as an artist because i think with exposure comes um taste Hmm. and i think that's really important for an artist i like that with exposure comes taste um you're in europe somewhere on one of these many trips Galloping, galloping around the globe. Now, um, what was an experience that you had that today still resonates through your art? Well, recently, I, I actually did a residency in in Europe mm. for two two months in Austria. Oh, okay. So you did get to Austria. Nice. And um, it's the second time I had been to Austria, but. Um, I did a two month residency and it was a difficult residency. There's all different kinds of residencies. Some of them really take care of the artist and this one did not. Mm. But, but I was able to put my head down and paint. And, um, I came out with a few paintings and, um, some real insight into why I was painting and, you know, sometimes you forget. Mm-hmm. So and, tell, tell um, us one of the insights. Share with us. Well, the I'm insight. Gonna, I'm going to probe. I'm going to probe. <laughs> the insight was um, how being the other felt again. How being the other felt. Mm-hmm. Now, what do you mean by that? Well, I I paint about being the other. I think that most <laughs> artists. Um, paint from being outside, you know, their, their experience of being outside and looking in um, from some kind of um, isolation. And so um, definitely they weren't used to my type of person in Austria, which was mm. difficult. <laughs> It, it was difficult on you, difficult on them, or just difficult meaning that your your person was difficult in their culture? Yeah, I was difficult in their culture. Yeah, you know, it's funny. I have a, a, a friend, and she's this wonderful Aquarius girl, and she's lived in Germany for many years. And um, she likes to piss them off by riding her bike with a big pink jacket. <laughs> <laughs> She just 
it, it just goes against like the very energy of this structure analytical like you know just being this more carefree spirited kind of person one day i was talking to her she was at the gym and they were, and someone yelled at her in german <laughs> Why are you talking when you're working out, you know? Oh, my. <laughs> well, I found Germany is a little little more open than Austria. Wow, really? Okay. Wow. Yeah. Well, very interesting. Germany lets all different products in and everything. Austria is very insular. Mm, okay. Like gotcha. our country is trying to get. <laughs> hmm. um, <laughs> it's, uh, that's interesting. Um have you done a residency other places? Yes, in Wyoming, that was like the most wonderful residency. Mm-hmm. We had um, different talents there, writers, um, musicians and composers and um, visual artists. And, um, and they had a, a person cooking for us. And all we had to do was be in our, our space, private mm-hmm. space. And then we had a, a small um, place to live that was separated, but it was not luxurious or anything, but it was definitely, um, they were honoring artists there and you felt welcome to do whatever you wanted to do and you were supported and it was, it was really lovely. Hmm. So there's all different kinds, of course. Mm-hmm. And and they're good because you you don't have any of the distractions of day-to-day life. So you get to work on your work only. And then they're bad because you you don't have, you know, a life outside of <laughs> outside of doing your work. And that's good for a small period of time, I think. Indeed. Yeah. And so the one in Wyoming, was that like a month long or two months long? No, or it was just two weeks. I, okay. I, I took, um, that was my first time. I didn't know what to expect. Mm-hmm. I'm not really a group person. You know, I don't function in a group because I'm, I'm a painter. <laughs> and so I thought, let me just try it. And it was just amazing. It was beautiful, and and the ranch that it was on in Wyoming was as big as Manhattan. What? That's what yeah, the saying. ranch itself. It's just the land out there is such a different concept. Wow. Yeah. Wow, that's awesome. Um, and then <clears throat> is that something? Then you just that's, pay like a a, a a fee, like a no, no, a you don't pay anything. Or, oh, they invite you out there, or? Yeah, you have to apply. This was mm. Brush Creek, Brush Creek Residency. Um, you apply. Some of them, I guess, you, they have a fee, but I wouldn't apply to that because I already have a place to live and a place to paint. Mm-hmm. So this particular one in Brush Creek in Wyoming, um, you had to have your own supplies and your own um Um, transportation there. Okay. But other than that, they provided the housing, the food, and the, um, the your studio or whatever you needed for your your work. I had a, a beautiful heated floor studio. Oh my what? god, that was it was so beautiful. So how, why would they do this? Like, or how do they make money or how do they profit off of that? Well, that's what the people in Austria was saying. How do they profit? But this a residency is actually supposed to be for the artist. You're, it's not a, it's not for profit. You are supposed to provide a place for the artist to grow. But Why? I'm sorry, like, my capitalistic mind is, like, is going in circles. Artists should be treated well. Artists are are the voice. Art, artists are the cultural gift to America or wherever you are. It's a cultural gift. Is that not right? 
Well, I mean, so is a doctor and so is a teacher and so is the guy who picks up my garbage and Yeah, and they're compensated. Yeah, so why how is the artist like okay, the artist is compensated. Like I'm trying to figure out <laughs> for some reason, like um somebody now maybe it's just out of the goodness of their heart, maybe they love the arts and this is one way that they're able to, you know, funnel large amounts of cash into something. Um but I, I I don't know, uh, but I'm trying to figure out why would somebody purchase a whole bunch of land or have access to land, create this, which this which is an incredible, cool experience. But to go to the extent of having uh, heated floors and you know and, and to provide food and like I'm just trying to figure out what is the corporation or the person who who's done that like what is it that they're getting out of it well this particular um ranch does have a luxurious place for people to come and stay at the ranch uh okay so this becomes and this like is on the you. property i got you so they have a business and then but they also want to support the arts and so they had a, they were able to have a facility that they right. could give but i think everybody's <laughs> purpose in residency is different Okay. Do you mean the so, artist himself, or no? I mean, who build who, gotcha. people who build the residency, and gotcha. there's all different types of residencies. Some so, you have to teach while you're you're trying to do your work. Ah, okay. Things like that. Gotcha. Gotcha. Yeah, you know, I've known a few like lawyers who own buildings. They had their law practice, but they love the arts. And so they would, you know, uh, maybe make a gallery on the first floor, right? So right. it wasn't really that they were in the art business per se. It, it was just a way of maybe giving back and providing space. And, you know, they made some revenues, but like, um, <clears throat> but with or without the gallery, they, you know, it wasn't um, hurting them. So, that, okay. So that makes sense to me now. All right. Now I can rest. <sighs> okay. Um, <laughs> but there's so many residencies. If you, you know, there's so many residencies out there. If you haven't experienced one, I think maybe you should. I, I think I would love to. Um, I'm just not really sure how that would function for me. Um, but yeah, that would be, uh, that would be an interesting experience. I know my buddy, he lives in DC now. I remember he had a residency in New York for like two months. It might've been three months. Um, and they gave him a little studio, actually it was mm-hmm. a pretty big studio. Um, and I would go up and visit him and, uh, that was really, really cool. And And he painted some incredible paintings out of there. Um, but, uh, so, okay. So, so so how many have you done then? Just these two. Um, it, it was, it's, it's hard to be away for two months from my family, I think. And that's where I was thinking too. Like, how how do you, you know, go away? And I was like, okay, well, maybe when the kids are in college or something, then, (laughs) then I could do something like that. But yeah, my husband met me in Europe, and then we traveled afterwards. Oh, really? That's cool. Was he an American or, or a European? My husband? Yeah. He's Korean, actually. Oh, well, he's neither then. Okay, so he's Korean. Um, well, that's cool. Is he from South Korea? Yeah. Ah, nice. Um, I was going to go in a direction with the conversation. I just realized no politics. So... Let's move on to something else. (laughs) (laughs) Well, that's what I paint about, politics. Oh, okay. Well, then let's stay on that subject. Um, (laughs) uh, So, um, yes. Uh, So what do you paint about? (laughs) (laughs) Right now, I I actually paint about things that are happening in the world and and how it affects me and Mm. how I relate to it. And my current, my series now is Current Times. So I've been working on that for a couple of years now. Hmm. And, uh, like, and, 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 and how do you, 
I mean, when you someone like when you look at your work, I don't see it like directly illustrated out, you know, like up in your face type of thing. But how, how do you approach that creative process on taking what's current and relevant, and then, you know, uh, pu- pushing it through your 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 view? Well, usually it's um, how how something that happens um, relates to what happened what I've experienced or mm-hmm. my reaction to it or, um, and then I, I basically, I, I talk to my model and we both come up with, um, it's kind of a collaborative, um, effort, um, how she feels about it and how I think the, um, movement in the body mm-hmm. would, um, reflect that. So maybe I can give you an example. Mm-hmm. Um, in my painting, Pendulum. Pendulum. Okay. It's three women of the same the same woman. Um, I was I was looking at um, what was happening in America, and um, I think Ruth. Uh, Bader Ginsburg had described um, somebody telling her that um, the way in America, or probably anywhere, is um, not a straight line. We don't, we don't, um, we don't progress um, with our politics in a straight line there's a way that um, it kind of comes back and forth uh-huh. and, and um, like a pendulum. Mm-hmm. So I was trying to think of how I thought that was very powerful, I'm not going to illustrate a pendulum, mm-hmm. but I thought um, a pendulum is, is kind of like um, looking at the past, l- looking at the present and looking at the future. Nice. And how how the past, our you know our country has gone through so much, um, in 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 the terms of equal rights, and um, the present we're still going through a lot for equal rights, and in the future, I don't think it's ever going to change, but we have some hope for the future. So I had the model. Um, look towards me for the present, mm-hmm. down for the past, and a, a forward for the um, future. Yeah, I'm looking at it now. I, I and see that. I paint with, so often I paint with broken shards built into the, mm-hmm. um, the gesso layer mm-hmm. to show that the world is a broken place. Hmm. So do you take those the shards? Do you like mount them before? Yeah, I. Into, okay. I I make the the shard. I break them. I put them into the gesso layer and put a gesso layer on top of it. Okay. Kind gotcha. of labor intensive, and then I start painting. That's cool. And and you just do it like in little sporadic areas or? Yeah. Okay. Just... Now, I, I saw like on, on the front of your website, you had um, this one piece. Um, and it looked like there were it almost looks like BBs or something, some type of little metal drops yeah, or something. They're ball bearings. Ball bearings. Okay. Wow. And then you, you, you did you put those in after? Or like in the beginning, and no, painted I put them around? in that afterwards. Okay, I was gonna, I was gonna say they look really, really clean. <laughs> yeah, um, they, um, that painting, Juice and Bellow, is about. Um, it's a Geneva Convention term meaning justice in war, and it's about suicide bombers who, who um, oh, prey on on citizens, which is a war crime. All right. Well, that's pretty intense. 
Yeah, that's who I am. <laughs> I'm goofy. <laughs> And my, my um, you you wouldn't know it by my work, but I'm the goofiest person you ever meet. And then I paint really intensely. <laughs> I love that balance because um, I find very humorous people. You know, they tend to be very intelligent, right? Um, but also, if they, I find in a lot of intelligently goofy people. They have to be to bring some type of balance to the level of seriousness that they put in other things. And um, because if you, if you didn't have that balance, you, you go insane. Right. Also, I think that people who can't paint serious things, um, they're, and they're painting pretty colors and flowers all the time. I think they, they're, they're afraid to go deeper. They're sometimes mm -hmm. afraid to go deeper. That's interesting. I, I, <clears throat> I'm hesitant to agree with you outwardly, <laughs> but, um, <laughs> but I think if I sat and kind of thought about it, I can already feel myself agreeing with you completely on that. Um, it, it's, people paint for different reasons and, and, and it's interesting. I never really thought about using your art as a way of hiding actually from the world mm -hmm. um, or maybe even hiding from your own self, you know? Um, I think a lot of people who are extremely skilled have just become so focused on developing their skill that they, they forgot to actually develop something to say. And, that, right. and that's a whole nother skill within itself. Um, right. You know, and that's possible. You actually asked me a question in the, um, in one of the um, questionnaires um, that, that asked me about my, um, my early influence. Mm -hmm. And it got me to, to think about that a lot. And my early teacher, my very first teacher, um, said, you have to, you have to go to school, um, not just to art school. She encouraged us to, to go, um, get an education so we can paint from something. Okay. She said, you have to, develop what you're you're interested in not just painting it's interesting and, yeah. and, then, that, and then so what she's saying is the painting is let's say the skill but or right. let's say the the is the vehicle for the message but the other interest is your message right that makes total sense makes total sense and, and in your case right now at least it's more of these political um commentaries well i think that's basically who i am actually interesting very interesting i'm kind of like uh, I'm, I'm like hmm i wonder what dinner is going to be like <laughs> <laughs> can i have the the ketchup no you don't sell anything red here <laughs> we don't have ketchup we have blueberry up um <laughs> uh that's awesome so <laughs> it, it, uh, very interesting and uh, are, are you um politically active or is that just through your work is that where you put your voice yeah i um i put my voice into my work um nice. i you know i volunteer sometimes but it's only because my son ropes me into his campaigns. Uh -huh. So is, is he in government? Uh, not exactly gov government, but okay. he, he works on campaigns. Okay, cool. Cool. Um, we're going to back away now. Back away. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm going to go down as the world's greatest tightrope walker today. <laughs> um, oh my goodness. <laughs> Yeah, you know, it's 
I've always had this very strange, um, it's funny, I consider myself to be a conservative, okay? But almost every conservative that I know tells me, I don't understand how you're conservative, right? That's what they say to me, right? And, um, and, uh, but being an artist and an art folk, it's always been very strange because I've always been around right. very progressive liberal people. And somehow I always find myself in this weird little moment, like where we're like, Oh, <laughs> how did you get into the house? <laughs> um, and it's just, and then it's like, eh, okay. And we all move on, <laughs> you know? Um, and, uh, and, and we just have good conversation after that. But uh, I, I think yeah. that artists have to be, if they're doing figurative work, uh -huh. they have to be humanists. They have to be about humanity. I don't I know how you can't be if you're doing figurative work and you have any empathy. I think you, as an artist, you paint from empathy, compassion and empathy. No? <sighs> I, I would agree. Uh, I mean, I, mean, I, I agree. It, it, you know, it's, it's really weird. I always say I'm the most open-minded person. I just, it, but right. Like I'll, I'll listen to any thought, entertain any thought. Um, but I, this is the part, this is the problem I run into people with people is like, I'll entertain the thinking, the thoughts, right. And actually be like, Oh, okay. Yeah. I get, I see that. I see that. I see that. But it doesn't mean that I'll actually um, think that. No, yeah, I think it. I'm trying to find the word, um, uh, can, like, actually, in, like, make it my own, right? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and for for me, I think maybe because of the life that I lived, um, you know, I was raised in foster care, so I bounced from home to home to home. So I would see all kinds of ways of living and treating people and thinking and. Oh, well, that's you, very interesting. You know, and so where I am, I always say I'm extremely progressive and liberal in my thinking. But when it comes to actually, let's say in my openness, okay. And I think that's why I'm highly creative because I'm very open to all kinds of possibilities. Right. And I right. see the intelligence and the beauty in progressive and liberal thinking. But I, but I always think that we think faster than reality. And reality, let's say the biological reality, right? Because in my opinion, thinking is a reality. So they're both. And one is is in a different realm. It's in a higher realm of perfection and people can see how things ought to be. But then there's reality, which says, okay, well, we can see that, but it might take us two generations to actually achieve that. Yeah. Even though we can see it so clearly, even write it down, talk about it, but to actually download that, energy that we see and, and maybe even are able to tap into on a, on a heart level, but to actually make it come through action and then permeate enough action that it would actually change a culture requires time. I know. I, I agree. It does require time. And, and that's where, um, and then, and then Added to that, I believe that it ultimately has to come from an inward heart change, not some yes. external system that's yes. causing yes. you to comply yes. to it. I know that's and, true, and and that's where and that's ultimately the single reason why I lean more conservative on things because I just know like we can change all kinds of things with good intention, but then we may get caught up in a wheel. You know, and it's like, oh, we didn't mean that. We didn't mean, you know, and and, and so I personally just like, let's just move a little slower, <laughs> you know, as long yeah. as we're moving towards that end goal, you know. So, you know. It, yeah, I have a painting about change and it's, uh -huh. um, it's called The Seed of Change. And it, I just think it starts with one little ripple or seed. Oh, that, here it is. Yeah. I like so the model. Who is she? She's actually a well-known artist model who lives in um, 
in San Francisco or outside of San Francisco, and um, her name's Pigeon. That's her her model name. Mm. And um, she was in New York for a while, and then she went to San Francisco, and she's. I so think how, she's how do amazing. you work with her? Does she oh, fly um, out to you? And, and yeah, it just comes comes out. She came out three or four times. Wow, that's that's cool. And I just totally love her and relate to her and <clears throat> almost see her as myself, and and that what works and now I'm trying to go to my next um, series and I used her for an entire couple of years on every mm-hmm. painting and now I'm trying to you know kind of go into my next series and um, having a problem finding a model with as much gravitas as she has hmm. and one that I relate to. I mean, yeah. I've been having these young models come and they, they're they like, I'm not a photographer and I paint a lot from from the images that I, I take. Mm-hmm. So it's looking like school pictures right now. Mm. So it's really tough. That's do, the biggest hurdle. You, I'm, I'm, do you sketch and think before, like sketch out your stuff before hiring mm-hmm. them? Yeah, I kind of have ideas, a couple ideas, but you know, you can't, you can't, um, at least I don't have it very solid until the model comes and I have some lighting and, and real, um, real hands on kind of. Yeah, I have I have a bunch of ideas, a whole list of different ideas, and I try to go through them and mm-hmm. and then maybe one works. You know, mm. it's tough. Yeah. It's tough for me if I don't have a model that I feel like is and is an extension of myself. Interesting. Very interesting. I know I, I worked with um, several artists who. Uh, I'm thinking of one who would always go out to this lake and take pictures of the lake. They live up in Michigan. And, um, or another one who took uh, pictures of flowers. She actually would bake them in her garden and stuff. And both of them, uh, it was interesting to walk them through a process of knowing what it is that they wanted to create in terms of the idea. And then having them articulate that in line and design and drawing. Um, And then having them go and find the resources, be it take the picture, work with the, you know, the the plants. Um, I've never had anyone yet uh, have that experience with a model. Um, But I always thought if you kind of got your idea, sketch it out first. And then, uh, so you had a plan to, to direct your model, um, then then it would probably go a lot smoother, a lot quicker, uh, and become a lot more accurate. So it almost sounds in my mind like you're actually sketching with the models present. You know, let's try this, move that, you know. Yeah, but um, I think for me, what is creative about having it all planned out and doing exactly what you've got in the photograph it, there's not to me i i want to like explore experiment you know find seek you know all mm-hmm. at all all times in the process before the process i want i want to still play mm. That's interesting. Because that's what's fun about painting. So painting is is uh, playing. Yeah, I play all day. <laughs> <laughs> painting is playing, and I'm writing this down. And I play <laughs> all day. Look at that! You need a T-shirt. That needs to be your brand. Uh, I paint all day. <clears throat> Um, that's cool. Painting is play and I play all day. 
Ah, that's awesome. That's like a hook in a song. <laughs> Um, here's a cr- crazy question. If that was going to be a song, what <laughs> genre of music would it be if it was going to be you? You know, I, I'm a fan of Tom Waits. You know who he is? No. Oh. <laughs> but I'm going to look him up real quick. Tom well, Waits. Hey. Yeah, he's, he's a storyteller, just I think like most artists. Um, yeah, and I cool. think he gets a lot of... Um, influence from um all different sources it's 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 wonderful actually and he puts it all together and he becomes his own um style mm-hmm. hmm. yeah, i think and he's like i'm quoting this but he's like almost 70 years old is he huh? yeah i'm looking at his picture i'm like oh he's probably like i don't know 45 and then it's like 68 years old, huh? So he's been around for a while. Yeah, um, I guess so. Yeah, I'm going to listen to some of his uh, his tunes yeah. when we're done here. He actually saved my life one time. His music or he himself? I guess his music. Okay. You got us hooked. Tell us the story. <laughs> All right. Well, um, I was living in a basement apartment in Washington mm-hmm. and um, w- was on... Um, when I, I heard the phone ringing when I was coming home at night and I just ran in to get the phone and talked and then hung up the phone and then, um, went to sleep, went to sleep. And I woke up with a, um, I had left his music on my little turntable. I was, um, I had a little turntable and I was listening to his record kind of old timey, um, record, um, player. Mm -hmm. And uh, I had the arm over, so it repeats and repeats. And then I fell asleep and, um, woke up with a gloved hand over my mouth and someone on top of me. And yeah. And so his record starts up again and he's got this very gravelly voice Mm -hmm. and he's like, and so, um, that's, the beginning of the record and this guy on top of me thought there was someone else in the apartment and he jumped off and out the door. Wow. So I'm, I'm devoted to Tom Waits. Wow. Wow. That's pretty intense. (laughs) It's, uh, he made me speechless. (laughs) <laughs> that's that's intense. Oh, wow. <clears throat> we'll just have a moment of silence on that one. Uh, <laughs> if anyone wants, wants to understand why it's this weird moment of silence, is I'm trying to figure out how to back out of that story. <laughs> <laughs> but let's go into it, actually. Screw it. Maybe that's the thing. Um, have you ever used that moment of terror or fear or whatever it was that you're feeling or what or that you felt in that moment have you ever or luck oh that's a great one holy crap that's great um have you ever used that source uh used that energy as a source for one of your paintings no i don't think specifically but i i do think i'm i've been pretty lucky throughout my life i think that Hmm. I am. I am lucky. So tell us a story of, of luck when you were traveling through Europe. Well, I think I'm lucky to be able to do that. Oh, shoot. I, you know, I think, I don't know. I, I kind of think I'm thankful for hot water kind of person. You know, Mm. I like, I know how, my family came up and I know how lucky I am. I know how lucky I am to be an artist. I think Mm. that many people in my line had talent. I mean, my parents could both draw. I used to like make them draw for me when I was a kid. And I thought everyone who grows up could read and draw. Hmm. You know, 
everybody. You learn how to read and you learn how to draw. So to be able to devote my life to painting, I think that's kind of amazing to me. It's an incredible response. Wow. Uh, is there one of your paintings out of the collection that um, really pulls on you like the most? Um, the one that um, you mentioned is my my like my home image or something. Okay, that yeah. Juice and Bellow. That, I think um, that's on my card and mm. it has an impact, I think, that um, that I think is important. It's an important painting. Um, in my current time series, I think the painting Steeled, which is a diptych, two-part painting, that's an important painting for me. Which, which one is that called? Steeled. Steeled. Okay. I'm trying to find it. And is that in your current times one? Yes. Okay. Oh, uh, okay. Yeah, here. Oh, yeah. So I'm just looking at that one. Okay, cool. Yeah, I like that one a lot. I'm kind Thank of wondering you. what what is it <clears throat> that um, she's contemplating on? Well, I mean, I think that you can interpret it any way if you're the viewer. I had um, a conversation with the model, and we both had a similar experience where we felt like we were basically outsiders, mm. even to the people who are closest to us. Yep. <laughs> and um, how, how it makes us feel like we have to, when we're confronted with a situation, even before we're confronted with that situation, we know it's coming because we've had experience in, in this type of thing. Um, so we try to prepare ourselves with answers or, or some kind of um, attitude that will steel ourselves against um, this experience of feeling and out, being an outsider in your own, with your own family. Mm. You know, I maybe about a. Two weeks ago, I was talking to one of my brothers, and um, I was sharing a story with him. And when I got to the um, punchline of the story, let's say, uh, he just looked at me with blank eyes, like, "Uh huh." What? He can't uh -huh. relate. And it was at that very moment that this made total sense to me. I was like, "Wow!" Like. You know, I told my daughter the same story the other day, and she's like, and and she, and what it was, I called a a college, and I and I asked this college, I said, um, is there a course that your students have been craving? Not your student, but your community has been craving, but you haven't yet been able to figure out, like, how to deliver it to them. And they said, well. If there was one, there would be, there's one. And the lady was tasked to figure it out, but she couldn't really figure it out. And she said, the title of it is called Design Thinking. Mm -hmm. And and so um, when I told my daughter that, uh, she like drops her little cup and she's like, duh, right? Because <laughs> like, <laughs> right? That's, that's what I do. And so I told my uh one of my brothers the other day about this experience and I was putting a course together for them um, to solve that, to solve that problem. 
And he just looked at me like, like, uh, like he was listening crickets. And, and it was in that moment I realized like, whoa, he has no idea who I am. No idea. <laughs> right. You know? <laughs> and, and yet, you know, someone in South Africa, I can tell them, they're like, oh my God, that's you. Right. And it was just so, it was just uh, that exact moment. And it gave me a sense of actually peace. And I think maybe that's part of the steel where it's like you come into an right. acceptance of this reality that sometimes the people who are close to you don't know you. Right. You know, and some who are close know you better than you know yourself. But <laughs> but a lot of times they just, and a, and a lot of times they don't know you because they often, um, the version of you that they know is 20, 30 years younger, right? It's It's not in some cases older than that, you know, younger than that, but it, it, it's not you. And right. um, yeah. So I, I get that. That's uh and, and I like that there's nothing there. It's almost like a storm coming in. And you almost feel like the beginning of, of, of like she's bracing against the elements, you know? Yeah. But, yes. That's <clears throat> the feeling that I, I had, um, um, that you have to brace yourself. Yeah. Yeah. And I like that there's warmth in the sky as if there's a sun and there's hope on the other side of it, but there's, there's a moment, a season where you, you know, you just gotta go through it. <laughs> so uh, yeah, I like that. That's powerful. Very, very powerful. Thank you. Um, so in terms of like, you said that your parents drew you, wa- you watched them, um, you grew up thinking everybody can draw and read. That's what we're supposed to be doing. Uh, and then you told us a story about your, your first teacher. What other educational experiences did you go through that helped develop you? Um, my first teacher also did something interesting. I used to paint very tight. And as a matter of fact, I, I, I was um, for a living I did um, Trump Loy, and I taught that at the Smithsonian. So Trump Loy is to deceive the eye with paint. So I would paint extremely realistically and, and tight. Mm-hmm. Um, but my first teacher um, poured sand into my palette, right on my palette, because I would paint so tight. Did you smash the palette against her head? <laughs> <laughs> No, I, because she she didn't want me to do the the knuckle work as as you say, you know. Uh huh. She wanted me to do broader, wider strokes, mm. and it taught me, you know, that you can you can put throw paint at at the painting and use a lot of paint and enjoy the texture and. And it taught me to, you know, go beyond those that little tiny um, fastidiousness of of trying to be, you know, very accurate and mm-hmm. and not and not have feeling. Mm-hmm. Not that you know, there's some people who can could do both, but that that was her method. Yeah, I would think that something like a Trump boy in that case, you know, um, the feeling and that part would probably be in the conceiving of the idea, you know, like that part. And then there's just the, it's kind of like the guy who hammers in the nail, you know, the architect well, designs it, but like, how much feeling is there in like, you know. You no, know, I had a match marble to real marble and there was, you know, you shouldn't show your hand. Basically, you have to do um, make make it look like there's no no human involved, Mm -hmm. and um, you know that was that's just the technique of. um, And I did antique furniture restoration Hmm. for the embassies in in Washington. That's what I did for a living, so I could do my own painting about what I wanted to paint on mm-hmm. my own. Mm-hmm. That's cool. 
Do you still yeah. do antique restoration? No, I don't. Um, I don't do that, and I, I don't really do any Trump Lloyd jobs at this point either. Did you? Um, how did you get into the antique restoration? I graduated from university in D.C. George Washington mm-hmm. University, and then um, I was looking for a job, and I always liked antiques, and I went and applied to an antique furniture restoration firm, and I told them, you know, I'm I could make my own gesso, I could do gold leafing, I have all these skills. And they hired me, but I was making what they were making at McDonald's, basically. Mm. So it was very, very tough to live on that. And so I started doing my own um, Trump Loy business as well. Okay, gotcha, gotcha. Um, that's interesting. And did you, when you did that uh, furniture restoration, was it always just as part of, another company or did you ever do that on you know for yourself no i did side? some jobs on my own and then you know kind of went back and forth between um trump Loy and some antique furniture restoration on my own as my own business and did you do your own restoration for your own stuff or you're like no i'm just gonna buy it nice finished polished. no no i <laughs> i have some beautiful pieces i i do nice the reason why I'm asking is I always find I always found that very fascinating, and um, I remember uh, this guy he would sell all this furniture and he had this woman who knew how to make it you know like do that old country look to furniture, so mm-hmm. they would go out and buy like really cool furniture from auctions or yard sales or whatever, and then she would re- I don't know if you call it restore it but redo it let's say, mm-hmm. and they would they would just come out incredibly gorgeous. And it was just like, whoa, these are amazing. So I, I, I'm assuming that's, that's not what you did, or maybe it was. Um, no, I do um, antique furniture <clears throat> restoration, like take off mm-hmm. the old glue and re-glue things or uh, restore the surface of something. So your job was then ultimately to make it look original. Right, and not okay. go over overboard with it. Yeah, mm-hmm. that's cool. So, it didn't, so, it, so it still looked antique, but not um, uh, right. So it's not it crumbling. Mm-hmm. If there's missing pieces, replace those, but not to um, ruin the surface of uh, the original surface. Yeah, that's cool. That's really, really cool. I like that. Yeah, and it would, um, I would, I would be able to work maybe a month and then take off a month and work on my own paintings. I, I didn't live, you know, very on a high level, but um, I would be able to to do work intensely and then do my own work for myself with my paintings yeah you know that's it's a it's a sacrifice you know i mean if you can live high and happy that would be idea but sometimes you have to make that choice you know and sometimes happy isn't isn't uh high living yeah happy was being able to paint exactly exactly and um so yeah you know that's that's commendable and respectable um so we're we're let's say five ten years from now your your model flies in <laughs> well, <laughs> you know, or maybe you fly out there i don't know but um where would you like to be like with your work where, what's like where do you see the next level let's put let's go to that question where do you see the next level uh, of, of your work being well, I definitely, um, feel, I feel like I'm painting what I want to be painting right now. Mm-hmm. And I just want to be able to do that my whole life. Beautiful. 
And do you do, uh, do you have like one woman shows and, uh, or uh, galleries yeah, have, that work with you on, on a continuous basis? I don't basis? have a, I don't have a gallery right now, but mm -hmm. a couple of my galleries have closed actually. Mm. Um, but I think that it's affording me freedom not having a gallery right now because in the past I've had galleries that wanted to keep my work, you know, brand new work for like nine months or something. Mm. They'd sell a few and it, it would go from my easel right out the door to a client I didn't even know mm. and it wouldn't get seen. Um, and it would be occupied for at least nine months. Um, right now, I've been able to send my work out. I have three museum shows coming up. I'm in, in part, it's a group show that I, I have pieces in three different museums. Nice. And um, I'm able to get seen and, and get some, some feedback and... Um, and show my work all over the country. So that's really wonderful for me. I've been, I've, I just had a, a one person show at a, a university, Penn College, the gallery at Penn College. And that was amazing. They, they really treat um, the artist nicely. And, and where's Penn College? Um, in Williamsport, PA. Oh, okay. That's what I thought. Very cool. Very cool. And that's a beautiful place and <laughs> beautiful people. Hmm. So I have to ask you about this one painting called. Called Global. What? Global. Global. Mm -hmm. um, I think this may be my favorite painting. Oh. Oh, hope I didn't upset you there. No, I'm, I'm okay. so glad you do. Um, but I find it, uh, strangely different than some of your others. Um, what, what was going through you when you painted this? This, I, I have a model that I actually met locally. This, this woman, she's not really a, a model, but she's, um, Oh, she's really... not the same woman as your other models? No. Oh, Okay. Good. So, she has a, the hair wrapped up. Okay, that makes sense. Good. So she's um she's just really a, a sweet, warm person mm -hmm. that I met um and brought her home with me. Um and she's posed for me a couple times now. And I think she's gonna come and pose for me again. But um she's a drummer. She does the drum line. Really? That's cool. Yeah, she's, she is really cool. And she has this um, head wrap that um, she, she wears for the drum line. Mm. Um, that's like African cloth. Yeah. And they're African drums. I was going to ask you that. Yeah, okay. Yeah. And um, then I, I went to Guatemala mm. recently. And I brought home some, I love the textiles from there. Yeah. And so I brought home um, the hulpa. Mm -hmm. is, is that how you call it? I'm not um, a, an Indian from the mountains. Well, <laughs> so I don't know. <laughs> but, but it's their traditional dress. Uh huh. A couple of them. And um, I just thought it would be, you know, that the world is so small and, and I think it's weird that we glom on to some one region that, that we come from or that our ancestors came from or something. I, I think we should accept all of the regions and all of the beauty that is all over the world. Mm -hmm. And I think that it's, um, it makes a much richer worldview and the beauty you know i just think it's it's um and that's why i was painting that one kind of 
more of a worldview. Mm-hmm. I like that. So she has the African uh, head wrap and then this Guatemalan, uh, I always want to say blanket, but it's, it's not a blanket. It's, the, it's not a blanket. It's the, the top. Yeah. There's different villages that make a different um, style of sewn top. Each. It, it kind of lays over almost like a poncho, right? In a sense, but like yeah, not long. it's got a little <clears throat> head opening, and mm-hmm. then it it gathers, and then you wear the skirt over it. But um, this this one is so beautiful. Hmm. So each village has its own um, woven style. Oh, really? That's so cool. You can tell I didn't know. Village. I didn't know that. That's nice. Yeah. So, and so you can tell where they come from. Cool. Yeah. Yeah. I can't. <laughs> <laughs> I'll have to ask uh, uh, my ex about it. She was from Guatemala, so my oh. children are half Guatemalan. No, Guatemaltecas. And oh, um, that's cool. It's yeah. a beautiful place. Yeah. Uh, well, I'd like to get there one day. Um, uh, depending on where you're at, obviously. <laughs> so you got to, um, like, if you go down, you have to stay with inside this one city. Don't go outside the city if you don't, you know, da, 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 da. Um, because it's it, it's beautiful, but it's also very, very rough, depending where you go. Yes, but the and, country itself, the the landscape is unbelievable. Uh, this is what I hear. <laughs> uh, very beautiful. Nice. Have you ever been to uh, Africa? No, never been to Africa. I have You're... some paintings there. <laughs> oh, really? That's cool. <laughs> <laughs> so you're there in spirit. Um, that's nice. That's nice. Yeah, I really like this. I like. I like the. Uh, the amount of white that you have in there. I like that it's on a, that it's this very, very light color. Uh, It almost feels like there's pink in there, but I don't know if it is or if that's just from the, um, um, from the, from the, from the colored top. Um, But I like that it's painted on this darkness, right? Uh, Is is that, is that painted on a board or canvas? It's on a board, and I wish you can see it in real life because the photo doesn't really um, show the um, depth of the color. Mm. Um, I'm a glaze painter okay. as well. You know, I, I paint with glazes, and so um, when you photograph them, it's very, I think it's very difficult. I got you. I got you. Um, you know what I love about it? It's going to sound weird, but just because I think very graphic and I, uh, graphically, I should say, mm-hmm. um, and geometric, I just, mm-hmm. I think what, what captures me is the diagonal that her, um, the top of her back comes in alignment with where the um, oh, scarf is. Interesting. And, I didn't even see that. And it to me, it's just such a gorgeous angle, and then to to have her basically built around that diagonal, um, it, it just it does something. I, I don't really know necessarily what it does to me. Um, and then you have these beautiful little curves and diagonals, kind of like forming her body. Um, it just has like this, almost like a. I feel like a Klempt coming through her. I yeah. feel even like a little Egon Sheila mm-hmm. um, coming through her in, in the way that the lines are animated or the edges, mm. I mean. Um, and so there's just, just a sim- simplicity of structure and, and, and elegance and edges that, um, and then I think the way that you painted her face, I mean, there's so much uh, going on in there. Um, so much life, so much movement uh, underneath her skin, on her skin, the light hitting her skin, colors, like all kinds of stuff. And yet it still looks just beautiful. And um, I think. Thank you. It's just very, very cool. 
Very I cool. love the way you interpret work, really, with a a, a very um, knowledgeable eye. Well, it is close to the brain. No. <laughs> Sorry, I had to be goofy there for a second. <laughs> Trying to get out of that room. <laughs> I think this is the first conversation where I always feel like I'm stepping into a spot that I'm trying to work hard to get out of. <laughs> and it's not just one, just like, mm. yeah. I, um, I will tell you, I, I do push people. <laughs> I do. So, I, you know, I and really. You're app- better for it. <laughs> well, yeah, I, I, that, that's. I really appreciate. I, let me tell you a couple things I appreciate about your work overall, especially this this series. I love the fact that you're committed to your model, right? I mean, just that I whole love entire my model. Yeah, I mean, just that whole entire relationship that you have, and and the fact that like she's on the other side of the country, you know, which brings it to a whole nother level. Um, and and I'm going any. Uh, let me write the note down about that model. Okay. Um, model the model relationship. No. Um, you know, I, I've always felt uh, a need to give models voices. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> They're not objects. Don't treat them like um, like a pot. Well, you know, and I think that's what most people do. And that, I know. It's why, like, one of the things when when I'm coaching people, I'm like, you know, don't draw the model. Uh, commune with the muse, you know. Yeah. And you have a muse. You don't have a model. So I yeah. guess technically, me calling her a model, um, but just it kind of goes against where I stand on it. But in this case, you know, um, you you have a muse, and, and you have a, an incredible relationship with her, and. Um, <clears throat> And, and, and you know, and, and that's the that's what I was gonna say. You have a relationship with her, which which is brilliant because you guys know each other, and now you can work and collab in that sense, yeah. right? Yeah, that's what I'm missing now. Mm. <sighs> yeah, that's I, yeah. I knew how lucky I was. <laughs> All right, I'm gonna pull you out of that space now. Come back. <laughs> okay. Um, <laughs> I just felt you step back into like this little <laughs> darkness for a second. I was like, ah, come, 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 come. It's, it's hard. Um, will you be able to work with her again, or is there a reason why? Well, I'm that... trying to do a different series. My se- okay, my gotcha. series has changed a little. I want to work on immigration issues. Okay. Cool. Cool. Um. Yeah, so I like that you have this relationship with the with the muse. I love that. Um, in every single piece, it's strong contemplation. It's strong thinking, and you really, really feel. Um. Uh, the conversation that's going on. And it's I like that it's these internal conversations. Um, and strangely, it's like you're in the middle of these, um, I was going to say dark moments, but they're not dark. I, I, I don't mean that in a negative context. I just mean like when you're in the middle of a storm or you're in the middle of a thought and you're exploring and you're going deeper, deeper into it. It's darkness because it's it's the unknown, right? But at the same time, like there none of your pictures feel like there's hopelessness or despair or or like someone's trapped in that moment right it's right, almost right. like they're, they're they're passing through it and you're capturing like i feel like they're pat like there's a, a bit a, a bit um beginning middle and end and you've captured the middle right but we still feel that there's an end like I love this one, uh, the ripple effect. Like you can just sit there with. It makes you want to walk over to her, sit down next to her, not talk to her, not disturb her, just let her know she's not alone, and just stare at the ripple together. You know, mm-hmm. and um, and 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 know that you wouldn't be staring at it forever. At some point, you'll get up and you'll start walking to towards the sun, 
or the or the sun comes to you right um and i feel like that's a beautiful thing because in almost all your images the presence of the sun is not fully present right it's always blocked out but it's always there and it's, right and it's not it's 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 just right there right like and so there's like always hope you know yeah i think that's the basic human condition and that's what i'm painting and i think that we we know about history and history if you can't deny it it it's it is you in humanity we come from that in humanity and we know that we've survived it and we know that it has changed us and there's always hope in humanity there's always hope yeah hmm. and it's you know, how it's... you have how you navigate that that makes you who you are years years ago i was reading um <clears throat> It's it's interesting. I, I'm not a a Bible literalist, right? Like when I die and go to heaven or whatever you call that, maybe I'll find right. out if Adam and Eve really existed or not or whatever, right? But um, I really don't care if they did or not. Um, but I love reading the, the first couple pages of the Bible, and I'll do it often because I'm a creative, and I know the guy who wrote those stories was a creative. Right. Um, and he's writing about a creative process, right? So are you, and, are you reading Exodus? Is that what you're uh, saying? Uh, Genesis, right? Oh, and, uh-huh. and, and then <laughs> That's as much as I know. <laughs> <laughs> Exodus is after they become slaves and they leave. Um, <laughs> so uh, there's, I always like reading the, the, you know, so one day I was reading it and it was saying, um, when God created, it said, let us make man in our image. Right. Mm -hmm. And, um, and so I'm looking at that. I'm like, huh, that's interesting. Right. And there was a couple of things when I read this, that really gave me some insight into what we do. Um, And it said, let us make man in our image. And then I was thinking, well, you know, God's not bio he's not a biology, right? He's this spirit, uh, you know? And so man isn't a biological thing. It's a spirit. It's a consciousness. Hmm. And then it, and then it it says, and then let us make a man, male and female. I was like, Oh, that's where we're manifested in the male and female, meaning um, that's when we're assigned biology. Right. Mm Mm-hmm. And like uh, a rain, like light, when it shoots through a prism, it breaks up into these different colors. And so um, within male and female, right, uh, there is the likeness and image of God. But what was interesting, it said, let's make, let, let's call him Adam and let's call her Eve. And in the Hebrew, when you translate it, Adam means human, but Eve means being. And that is what spoke to me the most. I was like, whoa, we can be human, but not human beings or being human, right? Like there's a way, like, it's almost like the human is the animal, but the, but when you're actually in being, you're, you, you, we raise into this other consciousness and, and you, you can, and the idea is how do you be both? You know, when, when can you marry uh, the fact that, for example, in humanity, we have such incredible beauty and potential and the things that we've made and the the things that we've done for people. And yet we also have done incredibly stupid and destructive things. Right. And, um, and we're neither one or the other, but we do both. Right. And, and I think the key, and this is what you were saying earlier about empathy. And I think this is the key to empathy is that, you know, I always thought it was funny how Adam lived in a perfect world when he was by himself. <laughs> he was lonely, <laughs> but lonely wasn't, you know, lonely doesn't separate you from God, right? It just, it just is what it is. But 
um, the real struggle in life comes when you have to figure out how to relate to another human being. Hmm. Interesting. Interesting. But that's also when we actually are fully alive, you know? Yeah. And, yes. And, uh, and so that's what I see, even though you have one, for the most part, like a single figure. Um, I like that all these images, they feel like they invite us into experiencing that experience, you know? Thanks. Yeah. I'm hoping that the viewer is the, the, the in dialogue. Indeed. Indeed. Mm -hmm. So th these are cool. These are very cool. Um, all right. So let me ask you before, um, cause we're going to do another conversation, you and I, uh, you may be so far you you're, you're planned it's planning to be we're planning that you're going to be the first you may be you may be the second but we're going to plan that you're going to be the first um so that at some point this summer i should know better in about two weeks when my schedule will be able to be flexible but um <clears throat> i want to come down and uh have dinner with you yes i'd love that and I'll bring my microphone so we can have two-way conversation. We'll do another podcast. Okay. Um, and actually, you'll you'll be the first person to do it, uh, like, in the flesh, right? Um, which will be really, really cool with real food, not just imaginary food. Um, <laughs> so, uh, and I love that. I love that idea. Uh, you know, when yeah, I started... You don't, you don't know. I... I'm like a fanatic um, with antique china uh -huh. and all this, you know, table settings. And I have, I've been collecting from every little job I did doing antique restoration. I bought a, a few more pieces of silver. Oh, wow. Cool. And I'm really into dinner parties and would love to have artists over. I, that's like my dream. And then when I read that about you, I'm like, what? You have to come over. Well, let's do it. And uh, um, I'm going to, I told my buddy, Kirill, I think I sent you his, his work. Um, mm -hmm. that he did in, So I said, uh, I sent him this morning that I'm going to come down and it's like, just let me know when. Um, he, would, <clears throat> he would be a fascinating uh, person to have um, at that table. Um, but we'll organize that. We'll set that up. And I, I'm so super excited about doing that, uh, with you and, um, yeah, we'll, we'll figure it out. And then obviously it'll be a cool experience, um, <clears throat> uh, for the listeners here as well. So before I ask you how people can connect with you, you have to tell us what would you like to be eating at this next meeting? Uh, my current favorite is any Vietnamese food. Uh huh. I really love Vietnamese. I think that it um, blends all different um, fresh tasting ingredients. That is bitter, sour, sweet, um, spicy. You know, all different high notes in one in one thing and i think that it's it's just a pleasure to, for taste buds and nice. um when i was in vietnam recently um we had a i don't i'm not sure how to pronounce it but cow che a broken rice soup okay and if you've never had that um, it is, it, it's just really spectacular. It's, it's like a breakfast food really, but, hmm. um, what is it like a, like almost like a porridge? Um, it's not like that, uh, Chinese rice soup that you might be familiar with. It, it has a lot more soup base hmm. and, um, <clears throat> You, you make the broken rice in a soup base and then you put more soup base in it when you serve it with okay. vegetables and you can make it in with um, 
uh, it's like a bone soup. Um, mm. You can make a bone soup and, and do that. But it has, um, dr- you know, dressing on it, like a salad dressing of the Vietnamese. Um, it's nook mom. And um, it has fresh um, cilantro and 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 very savory um, sautéed vegetables. It's just really a wonderful, interesting, flavorful soup. That's beautiful. Huh. Yeah. Yeah. Is there? Do you want to cook it, or is there like a yeah, restaurant we'll it. go to? No, oh no, no. shoot! Oh shoot! So um, I can't find a, a restaurant that does it the way they that we had it in Vietnam. Oh wow! Um, and then uh, and did you go there with your husband then? My whole family. Nice. Um, so I have to ask you: Does your husband cook good Korean food? He doesn't cook. Oh my goodness! Okay. <sighs> oh, 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 yeah. Okay. Do he you... came over when he was sixteen. He's pretty traditional. Oh, okay. Okay. Traditional in American ways. Traditional in Korean ways. Korean. Oh, okay. I got what you're saying. Okay. Do you cook Korean food? <laughs> I guess yeah. that's the question. Okay. Yeah. So okay. I cook now, everything. Now, um, did you grow up cooking then? Or is that something yeah, you picked up a, later? No, it's a creative process. I think a mm. lot of artists are real cooks, aren't they? But the, uh, yeah, but doesn't that I mean they're real good? <laughs> like, hey, let's get creative. Let's put some of this in there, some of that, and then <laughs> then they're the only and they're, they're the only ones left eating their own creation at the end. Of the- <laughs> no. It's good. Come on, people, try it, please. <laughs> No, I, I really, I like, um, I like going to different countries, experiencing different food and coming home and, and trying to recreate that. And I like the research, you know, I like that kind of thing. That's same thing as puzzles. I like, um, crossword puzzles. Yeah. Yeah. Same thing. It's all the same thing in my mind. It's a puzzle. It's, it's just problem solving. Yeah. In a fun way. Creative way. Yeah, that's cool. I like that. I like that. Yeah, I I, I, I love cooking. Um, <laughs> I think I remember the first two things I ever cooked were hot dogs and uh, <laughs> and candy. Oh. But it wasn't in a good way. It was just that we were so dirt poor and living in some crack house. And we, had oh, no. this, we took a, the little... Bunsen burner stove or whatever <laughs> they had, and oh no! And so we kind of like we had some candy bars or something, some kind of little candy that we were chewing on. I'm like, what? Why don't we cook it? <laughs> and so we like melted it into like candy soup of some sort of I don't know what the heck it was, but some melted jalopy thing. Um, what is your favorite food? What's my favorite food? Honestly. <sighs> I love just great pizza. Mm. <laughs> it's like I love great pizza. Um I also love very creamy things. Um creamy food. Uh like custards and things like that. Um I remember when I was in college, Kirill, the guy I was talking about who lives in DC, um I was cooking or I made something. I think I made chicken with uh cream of mushrooms on it. Um, which always just comes out fantastic. But he's like, man, all you do is eat creamy stuff, right? <laughs> he's like, yeah. and I'm like, what are you talking about? And then I came back to Pennsylvania and it was like, would you like some broccoli and some cream cheese sauce on it? You know, would you like this? Would, you know, and then I was like, oh my God, like we eat creamy stuff all over the place. And like even ice cream. When I buy ice cream, which I probably buy one thing of ice cream a week, I literally will drive home slow or the long way just to give it extra time to melt. <laughs> <laughs> so, so then when I open the, the 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 top of it, oh, that little like that melted ice cream right there on the top of the lid is like 
for me, the greatest treat ever, right? That's so funny. Yeah, it tastes delicious. It looks like dog vomit, but it tastes <laughs> delicious. And then I just scoop until I hit like the, f- the frozen well, ice how cream about again. Soft put it back. serve. You- well, soft serve is nice, but it's not melted. Uh-huh. <laughs> but I not would, but I, but I, but I, melted, and I don't mean like. Yeah, liquidy melted, but enough that if you want it, you could drink it, right? But like creamy mm-hmm. melted. Then soft serve. The worst kind of ice cream for me is is really like like hard ice, like you just put right. it out of freezer Crystally, and you're, yeah, you know, and you're scooping it. But if it's ice cream, I'll eat it no matter what. But <laughs> soft serve, I I do really really enjoy. Um, well, soft serve on a hot day, maybe. Yeah, and it's melting down your hand. And, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Although gelato is nice because it's like ice cream, like an Italian ice cream, but it, it's mm-hmm. a little more custier, has a little more like a custard to it. Yeah. Um, and Good so that's gelato. Really, what was that? Yeah. Good gelato. Yeah, yeah. And, and it was interesting in Portugal, they had a very famous. Um, uh, ice cream franchise there and it's been around for a long long time and i guess the story was that there there's been a special relationship between um i think it's called like santintini's or something like that some italian name ice cream and i was like Mm -hmm. why is it like an italian place in portugal and i was uh hanging with this italian girl and her daughter and um and she was telling me the reason why is because i guess because Portugal and um, uh, Italy both had had dictators or something like that at, for a very long time, or there was something similar. I knew it was about the dictators, but it was something even maybe even before that uh, with these kings. And there was a king in Italy that had to uh, was exiled or something, and so he 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 fled to Portugal. But he loved his ice cream, so he brought his ice cream maker mm. with him. Wow! <laughs> and they set up in Portugal, um, and so the ice cream maker—that's that's how they got this uh, Italian branded ice cream in Portugal. Cool! It's just incredible. So yeah, <laughs> the history of food. <laughs> yes, it's that's interesting. So, yeah, very very cool. So. Uh, Vietnamese food and uh, slightly melted ice cream, I think, is what we're, what we're going to have. Okay. <laughs> we'll top it off with a pizza. <laughs> <laughs> that's so cool. Weird. <laughs> well, the um, that soup is very creamy. Oh, okay. Cool. Yep. Cool. I don't think I've ever had Vietnamese food before. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. It took me a long, long time to eat Korean food. Because I just, the way people described it to me, it just sounded like the nastiest, grossest thing. Like, who the hell would want to eat rotten cabbage, right? right. And, and and then one day, I'm like, uh, because I'm in Pennsylvania, we have so much Pennsylvania Dutch. We even have a holiday, you know, where you eat um, uh, like... Um, where you eat like uh, like pork and, and sauerkraut, right? Uh huh. And so um, I think it might be the f- I think it might be actually New Year's Day that you start the year for good luck with eating pork and sauerkraut. And so I'm like, oh my gosh, I love sauerkraut outside of oh. the, <clears throat> the gas that it gives you. But I love sauerkraut, and I'm like, wait, what am I doing? Like, isn't sauerkraut basically like kind of on the exactly. borderline rotten cabbage? No, so, it's exactly the same concept, and it's it's good for you, very yes, good for you. And, it is, and and so is kimchi. Yeah, and so I went to Atlanta, and my my best friend, um, he he got married to a Korean girl, and so this was a year before they got married. So I so I, I went down for two months because I was like, you know, he's never going to be free again, and. Um, <laughs> <laughs> And and we went down. You're so funny. And he he took me to some Korean place, and I was like, oh, I was nervous, but I was a little bit more open because I had that revelation about um, sauerkraut. But I was still nervous. And he got me this thing. I think they call it a a, 
I'm going to mess it up. Uh, Bibimbap. Bimb- yes, yeah, say it again. I a, knew it. Bibimbap. Bibimbap. Oh, my God. That was yeah. like one of the tastiest things. I make my things. own version. That's, oh, it's really shoot. fun to eat. Yep. Oh, That's- yes. And now I can't have to come find from any... more than one meal then. Yeah. And now I can't <laughs> I can't find any like Korean places near me. Yeah. And I'm like, ah. Oh. So yeah. We we went the day before he got married, he he took us all out to eat. Um and we went to this Korean place called the the Honey Pig. I think it was called yeah, Honey Pig. And it was a place where you actually like grill the the meat. Right. On the table we have one here. Yep. Oh really? Oh, cool. So, um, yeah, that was, so I'm hoping, I'm hoping that my experience with Vietnamese food, and I know we have a Vietnamese restaurant not not too far from me, um, but everybody that I know, when they go to a Vietnamese place, they always come back with these incredible, like, raving reviews, like, oh my gosh, it was amazing. Yeah, you'll like it. It's easy to eat. I think that, um you know, anybody, it's, it's not too extreme and, um, anybody would enjoy the food. How would you compare it to Thai food? Um, Vietnamese is a fresher tasting, I think. Oh, okay. That's Thai. Um, to me, it has, um, you know, more sauces, more, um, I don't know. It's uh, Vietnamese is brighter. Hmm. I don't know if that makes sense, but well, you know, I, I when I had Thai food, it was very strange. Like they put a lot of ingredients, it seems, in Thai food. Um, but like I went down the list, I'm like, oh, I love that, I love that, I love that, I love that, and it was like eighty percent of it was like, oh my gosh, if you would have just kept it in that eighty percent, for me personally, it would have been heaven. But then they add like these one or two other things to it that give it uh, this, I don't know what you More insistent. Mm-hmm. It's like more yeah. of, like, I'll, I'll call it in my ignorant way, more of an Asian-y taste, right? <laughs> um, whatever that means, you know? <laughs> so funny. It's just like this strange <laughs> spice that's not native to, you know, Pennsylvania <laughs> land. Um, <laughs> well, being an artist, you should try every food. No. Yes, I'm gonna take I have you no desire to go to the Philippines <laughs> and eat a, a dead oh, goose out of an egg. Oh, my God. But no, there's great Filipino food. I agree. I agree. You know, <laughs> I think <laughs> as a, you're making me think, like, why have I tried all these different foods? And I realize well, it's never been about the food. It's always been about the girl who was serving or the girl <laughs> next to me. So... Uh, my yeah. <laughs> my husband, uh-huh. you know, he, when I met my husband a hundred years ago, um, <laughs> he had only tried Korean food. Makes sense. <laughs> and maybe Chinese, you know, everyone has had Chinese food. And, you know, I took him to, I think it was the, our first date. He He wanted to go to lunch with me. Mm-hmm. And um, I took him to this little hole in the wall because I, I think it was Thai actually, mm. and um, it was just like a couple tables and and it was almost like a hallway. Mm. And he wanted to pay by credit card, and um, they didn't accept credit cards. I had to pay because he had no cash, mm. and he'd never tasted that and. You know, it, and then we just, I mean, he's so open to everything. And, but we live in right outside of DC where all the embassies are, all the people from all the embassies mm-hmm. are. It's a very international area. Even our little suburb has like the best um, um, Indian food, oh. you know, ev- places, I mean, unbelievable. Mm-hmm. And, people from there are eating, you know, eating Mm -hmm. there. So it's very authentic um, foods and you just have to come down here for, for more than a day. I'll tell you a funny, funny story. 
about Indian food. Mm, I love Indian food. It's incredible, right? Yeah. Um, my sister is a Muslim, and so when I'm up visiting her, we'll go to the we'll go out to eat, and um, so we always have to go to a halal place where they mm-hmm. make. And so the Indians, uh, this place is like a this Indian place um, where they made the, the the halal food. And I walked in, and I was just like, "Oh my god, this is the dirtiest looking place in the world." Um, and so I was a little nervous, but oh my god, the food was incredible, right? And um, and so I was like, I'm hooked. Like, I love this stuff. This is incredible. And so when I was in Portugal, uh, I would always treat myself. I found a little halal uh, um, Indian place. And, um, Are you sure it's not Pakistani? No. Well. Indian? No, it was, it was Indian. I mean, um, I, I think actually most Muslims in the world are actually Indians. Um, just because there's so many, because there's so many uh, uh, Indians. No, uh, there's a difference between. There are some Pakistanians. Like when I was in Portugal, you had both. You had uh, you had your Sikhs and stuff from out of uh, India, and then you had Pakistanians. And um, uh, and I was friends with a lot of them. Um, it was kind of cool. But uh, so there was this Indian place, right? Uh, and so it was just funny because it just had like. I would go in there and my real only pet peeve when it comes to eating is when people eat with their mouths open. (laughs) And I would literally like have to go and sit underneath the TV. So it would help drown out the sound of people eating. And, um, (laughs) and so one day I walk in and it's during the month of Ramadan and mm-hmm. so I was like, oh, my God, oh, my God, I have the whole entire restaurant to myself, <laughs> right? And I ordered, I was so happy. I was like a pig <laughs> in his own little thing, right? And I had all this food and um, and I was just so happy. And then uh, I saw the, the guys getting, starting to work faster, right? I'm like, huh, what's going on? Mm. And then I looked out the window. And yep, I started the end to, of Ramadan. Yeah, the, the, the sun was going down. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and oh my God, I felt like I was caught like in a vampire movie. Oh, no. Um <laughs> where I'm trying to like rush to to like get, get you know to to get safe before the, the darkness comes. <laughs> because as soon as that was dark and I was still in there. I don't know, like a hundred people came in that place wow. and they feasted. And I was just like, I was in hell and, <laughs> um, and trapped. <laughs> and then I just busted out laughing. Cause that's what I do. And, uh, it was a very cool, interesting cultural experience. And it was, but it was quick. Cause they, they were like, you know, like hyenas on a carcass. They were, and then they were gone. They were like piranhas. Cause they were hungry. And then they just left and it was like, Oh, I'm all alone again now. (laughs) (laughs) It was was funny. So, uh, how can people get in, uh, how can people connect with you? Well, um, I have a website. It's, um, judithpeck.net and, um, I'm on Facebook and Instagram as Judith Peck. Now, is Peck your maiden name? Yes. Okay, because I was like, oh, that's a very interesting Korean last name. <laughs> Kim. Kim is the Kim. Okay, so Judith Peck Kim. Yeah, but I don't um, go by Kim professionally. Yeah. Um, yeah, I hear a lot of artists, uh, specifically women artists, do that. Well, I've that's been an artist all my life, so way before I was married. Yeah, that's that's I'm not going to change my name. That's what they say. <laughs> um, yeah. And so I was like, huh, that, that makes a lot of sense. Um, very cool, very cool. So judithpeck.net, and I'll take that and I'll put that in the um, the show notes. And would you like me to put uh, your Facebook link in there as well? Sure, if, if you want to. Okay, cool. So I'll do that. And um, this is a, a fun conversation. Um, yeah, thank you so much. 
and it's a um, pleasure. Yeah, yeah. It was a nice dancing of like you know, <laughs> going into a shadow and coming back into the light and this and that. And <laughs> the, it was it was kind of like it was like a ballet, like more like a waltz through through a land land field, like a like a field <laughs> of landmines, and we made it to the end <laughs> gracefully. <laughs> really a landmine oh my goodness well from my perspective that's what it felt like <laughs> <laughs> but it's lovely cool it was awesome thank you we'll talk thank later. you yeah, bye-bye in just 30 days the core 80 experience teaches you to decode the intentional design underneath great masterpieces through video lessons, assignments, and feedback, you learn to recognize the underlining structures like thrust maps, echoes, and gamuts that give master compositions substance and gravitas. Knowing how master artists and illustrators compose their artwork unlocks your ability to give your artwork more meaning and energy. Enroll today and get a 7-day no-hassle money-back guarantee at Core80.com.